So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. Max Kapler really taught right to, from the beginning in his 1956 to 58 series at the point of life that the whole issue is the law of cause and effect. On what basis do we want to have an effect? The effect of prayer. Do you want it on the basis of understanding or on the basis of belief? What is the basis of understanding? It is that life is mind, spirit, soul, principle. That this is the cause of every true effect. So both understanding and belief have effects. They are both able to cause something, but the effects of a true prayer are of the same nature as that prayer. So the one, two, three, four is is five. Mind, spirit, soul, principle is life. It's the cause of its own effect. What is it that life refers to for its self-maintenance? It can only refer to mind, spirit, soul, and principle, to those first five prayers. And he says that the, the symbol here is the circle. He puts that into his uh, study material, that it is the mortal circle versus the divine circle. So the mortal circle means that what the mortal, what mortal mind gives out, mortal mind gets back. And the divine circle is life sustaining itself that life cannot sustain anything outside of its own sphere. So life sustains life. The living system sustains itself. So the whole issue of cause and effect comes up in this subject to show us that a divine cause has a divine effect that a mortal cause has a mortal effect, a belief effect, and that we get back from prayer what we put into prayer. So here life is only dependent on itself. What is itself? You have to go back to see what the close causal circular process of life is. That's itself, and that's mind, spirit, soul, principle, life. Life is fed by itself. So life goes out from its source and comes back to its source and never leaves its source, and that source is feeding it. Life feeds the source, and it feeds the effect. So the epitome for life, then, is that the prayer of an understanding, living devotion to the divine, what would that understanding, living devotion to the divine be at this point? What would the life sense in us be? To always begin with mind, spirit, soul, principle, 
that this is life. This is a living devotion to the divine within us. And that is willing to sacrifice the mortal. That will not go outside of the divine circle, the divine cycle. You see that teeming hyper cycle, <laughs> hyper cyclical nature of the self-organizing principle now is maintaining itself, sustaining itself by referring to itself in closed circular causal relationships to itself. And that is bringing us into unity with the all renewing life. That's how life renews itself, how the system renews itself and brings out new aspects of itself, new views of itself. Always one and the same system, but renewing itself or showing itself forth in a new way. Isn't that the relationship of principle to life? That's about the relationship of principle to life. What is that relationship? What's the difference between principle and life? Principle it gives you the, the system, doesn't it? The point of the system or the structure of the system? The system. And what is life? Life is the fact that that system, that structure is so fundamental that it can express itself infinitely. It has infinite applicability. When you touch a principle, there's no limit to the application of it. That is the redundancy of it, huh? That's the abundance of life. The abundance of life is not having just a lot of money. <laughs> or a lot of anything else. It's having one principle which is able to express itself without limit. You must know this relationship in order to really understand the beauty of, of this that is in prayer. So it's, it seems to be here that the divine self-organizing principle is the redundancy principle of life or the principle of autopoiesis. But remember what we saw at the beginning of the week that autopoiesis has three distinct aspects to it. That we can see it purely from the standpoint of life. We can see it from the standpoint of truth and from the standpoint of love that these three aspects are found in the sum total meaning of autopoiesis. Well, let's take our subject and our text now. Life as mind. The question is, wherein lies this living devotion to the divine? What is our living devotion to the divine? which we have already stated is a devotion to returning to mind, spirit, soul, and principle. That this is the closed, circular, causal field. What we say? A closed, causal, circular process is the, the circularity of mind, spirit, soul, principle, life. Mind, spirit, soul, principle, life. This is the circularity which life never leaves. As mind, it lies in the fervent, constant desire to know and do the will of God and in a willingness to sacrifice everything for it. She begins by saying, petitions bring to mortals only the results of mortals' own faith. Can you hear it? It's a law of cause and effect. Yeah. There's 
nothing progressive in a near equilibrium mortal cycle. It's a closed circle too, but it has not the principle within it, no openness within it for progress. But life does, even though it's a closed circular causal process, it is that which will bring forth a total openness. We know that a desire for holiness is requisite in order to gain holiness. There you have another instance of a relationship of cause and effect. How can we gain holiness? We have, must have a desire for holiness, and so she's really touched on the mind aspect. How can we gain holiness or have that as the effect? Well, first you have to desire holiness, mind. That holiness being really love's equifinal state. But if we desire holiness above all else, and so now she's qualifying the desire of mind. It says you must include in that closed loop causal circularity spirit. You must desire it above all else. That's spirit, mm -hmm. isn't it? Then we shall sacrifice everything for it, a touch of soul. We must be willing to do this principle that we may walk securely in the only practical road to holiness. So she brings it right back to life. So there's only one method of life. Life is the word of life. Prayer cannot change the unalterable truth, nor can prayer alone give us an understanding of truth. But prayer, coupled with a fervent, habitual desire to know and do the will of God, will bring us into all truth. And we have the invocation that life is leading to truth that life will lead us into truth as we are being led further into love's equifinal state of holiness. Such a desire has little need of audible expression. It is best expressed in thought and in life. Best expressed, you have thought and life, the Subtone is life as mind, and she's coupling those two together and saying that we need that fervent, constant desire to know the will of God and to do the will of God, that we will sacrifice everything for it. See, sacrifice everything to the, to the operation of that feedback principle. And this is best expressed in our life, as our life. So life is its own cause and effect. We see that the desire for holiness is requisite in order to gain holiness. But what that implies, the moment you touch mind, is that you must be in relationship, in cybernetic relationship to spirit, to soul, to principle, that this is life. Life as spirit, the epitome is that question again, wherein lies the living devotion to the divine? Also in deep and conscientious protests of man's likeness to God, and his unity with God. The prayer of faith, she says, shall save the sick. 
All right, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Actually, she's not saying that. She's quoting the scriptures. But which faith is the right faith? This is the question. Is it the blind faith, belief? And she's going to show us, or the text, the system is going to show us, no, it is the understanding of the divine healing principle. The right faith is an understanding. She will even show us that it is a human understanding of the divine healing principle. What is this healing prayer? A mere request that God will heal the sick. So we hear that anything within us that is empty, substanceless, that doesn't fill itself with the cybernetic orbit, the cybernetic cycle and round of mind, spirit, soul, principle, and life, a, a mere request has no power. Nothing has power but that closed, circular, causal process of the word of life. It has no power to gain more of the divine presence than is already at hand. Let me read that again because it has a little different uh, take to it than I've given it. A mere request that God will heal the sick actually has, has no power one way or the other, and it certainly has no power to gain more of the divine presence you hear the divine presence of life that you cannot gain more of life than is already at hand. And so the beneficial effect, you see effect, cause and effect, what is the beneficial effect of such prayer for the sick? It's on the human mind. Making it act more powerfully on the body through a blind faith in God. So blind faith also has an effect, but it is not of the nature of God. This, however, is one belief casting out another, a belief in the unknown casting out a belief in sickness. It is neither science nor truth which acts through blind belief, nor is it the human understanding, something we don't expect to see really, the human understanding, but it's beautiful to see that the understanding, even the human understanding is what Jesus had. He had the human understanding of the divine healing principle, which was manifest through his humble prayers. You see, his humble prayers, which were deep and conscientious protests of truth, of man's likeness to God, and of man's unity with truth and love. So we see that it is the it was the substance of his prayers, that his prayers were deep and conscientious protests of truth, of man's likeness to God, and of man's unity with truth and love. You see that prayer is the human understanding of the divine principle at this point, which is expressed in those prayers. And what is this understanding? If we look at the text, we see that she shows the cause and the effect. That the cause is the earnest desire to know God and not blind belief that as spirit, 
we must substantiate that desire with the deep and conscientious protests of truth and not a mere request that as soul we must be humble and that as principle that brings us into unity with God and what is the effect this has a positive healing effect it is actually autopoietic an autopoietic system is self-healing it can heal itself it can repair itself through its own law of cause and effect through sustaining itself maintaining itself it is self-healing and that is the effect that she wants to show here the effect of the human understanding of the divine healing principle the human understanding of the principle of mind spirit soul as the principle of life 